This is our A pressure recording. What is the deep descent and why does it get deeper at times versus others? What is the name of the hemodynamic finding on this RA pressure recording and what is the diagnosis most suggested? So the way you start, you see a high RA pressure, around 18 millimeter of mercury. Whenever you have high RA pressure outside tamponade, you will get deep wide descent during inspiration. You can try to time that descent and prove it is why. Y comes after V and V comes after T. So this is V and this is Y. You can do that, but I can tell you even without the EKG, high RA pressure, the deepest descent is the Y descent and it's deeper during inspiration. And why does this happen? During inspiration, you have an increased venous return to the right heart, which causes a propensity for the V wave to rise and the Y to become deeper. The bigger the V, the deeper the descent in early diastole via the Y descent. The V wave may not rise dramatically because you have the direct effect of the negative thoracic pressure getting superimposed on that rising V wave and preventing it from rising in absolute value, but you will get a deep Y descent. What is the name of the hemodynamic finding? The mean RA pressure doesn't change much. So this is what we call the Kuzmol sign. So we have Kuzmol sign and deep Y descent, especially in inspiration. What is the diagnosis most suggested? Overwhelmingly, it is right heart failure. Constrictive pericarditis can give you that, but it's far less common cause of that. So whenever you have high RA pressure, it's a sign of decompensated RV failure. And whenever you have high RA pressure over 15, you inherently will have those two findings, deep wide descent, especially with inspiration and Kuzmol sign. In fact, if I see high RA pressure in this range, yet the mean is fluctuating with respiration without deep wide descent, I will be wondering if my zero is incorrect, my calibration is incorrect, because you inherently will have those whenever you have RV failure with high RA pressure. And Kuzmol sign means the RA pressure mean doesn't change with respiration and doesn't drop with inspiration and may in fact rise. And that's what we did in this patient. We asked him to take a deep breath and you can see paradoxically with deep inspiration, the RA pressure rose in particular, the V wave became much larger and the Y descent became much deeper. That's a full-blown Kuzmol sign. Again, this patient had severe RV failure from dilated idiopathic cardiomyopathy. Note that tamponade is the only high RA pressure with a flat Y descent. It's FYT, flat Y tamponade. This is another case. This is RA pressure recording. What is the diagnosis implied by this RA pressure? You need to know that. Very common and pathognomonic for one issue. This is pathognomonic for severe tricuspid regurgitation. The idea here is the RA pressure is speaking in a plateaued manner in systole. It's looking rectangular in systole. This is what we call a ventricularized RA pressure. So normally you have a V wave on the RA pressure waveform that peaks after the T. In this case, you're having one large wave that's peaking throughout the STT as in a ventricular pressure. This is a ventricularized RA pressure. In a way, it reflects that in wide open TR, the RA pressure tends to approximate the RV pressure and becomes nearly similar to it in morphology and sometimes in absolute value. 
Another way of looking at it is that normally you have AX V5 and the X is interrupted by the C bump, which corresponds to the closure of the tricuspid valve, the isovolumic contraction. In patients with severe TR, during isovolumic contraction and afterward, you'll get massive flow backward of volume and pressure in the RA. So you get that fused CV wave in the right atrium. And that's what you have actually. You have a C wave here, and this is the true V wave, but we call them fused CV wave or plateaued V wave. On the left, when you have MR, unlike in TR, you get tall and late peaky V wave. You don't get the wide ventricularized V wave because on the left, the LV pressure is much higher than the LA pressure, so much so that it's harder for that LA pressure to approximate the LV pressure than it is for the RA pressure to approximate the RV pressure or come within a striking distance of it. This is another illustration of a ventricularized RA pressure where the V wave is not only high, but it's plateaued and rectangular, just like a ventricular pressure. This is another case, mitral disease. This is a 75-year-old female with a history of recent mitral clip for MR at an outside institution. She continues to have dyspnea and severe persistent pulmonary hypertension on echo with a PA pressure in the 80s. She is also severely anemic with a hemoglobin of 6.5. On echo, she has no MR, but there is mitral stenosis with PISA seen on the LA side and mitral mean gradient of 10 millimeter of mercury at a heart rate of 100 beats per minute. Is it severe MS and what's the next step? So she has a mitral gradient of 10. Did that mitral clip make it a restrictive mitral orifice with MS? If you look at this picture, what is your guess? Is it severe MS or not? My guess is no. This is rather anatomically mild MS that was made hemodynamically severe by having a high flow. As we know from the Hackey and Gorlin equations, the pressure gradient across the stenotic valve is highly dependent on the flow, is dependent on the square of the flow across it. So in patient who is anemic, you can imagine that the flow is dramatically increased across that valve and that's causing an anatomically mild MS to become hemodynamically severe. Also tachycardia very much affects the gradient in MS more than it does in AS. So my guess is this is mild MS with a high flow state becoming hemodynamically severe because of the flow conditions. And here I will further elaborate on MS assessment. There are two issues in hemodynamic MS assessment. The first issue is the relatively low guidelines gradient cutoff for MS severity. So, for a patient with a normal cardiac output and a mitral valve area of 1.5, the gradient will be anywhere between 11 to 13 millimeter of mercury. So the guidelines usage of 5 to 10 millimeter of mercury to call mitral stenosis severe is very lenient. Really, to be more specific for mitral stenosis, the mitral gradient must be over 10 to 15 at a heart rate less than 80. Gradient cutoffs for MS are very sensitive but not specific, unlike the gradient cutoff for AS. The gradient cutoff for AS is very specific. In general, valve area is important for defining severity in both AS and MS, but not in AS if the specific mean gradient is over 40 is met. So if if you have AS with a gradient over 40, overwhelmingly, you don't need to calculate the valve area. You do have severe AS. However, valve area is more important in defining the severity of MS than AS, as you may have a gradient more than 5 to 10 millimeter of mercury related to tachycardia and high output on top of a mild MS.
And this is what we call the MS that is anatomically mild, but hemodynamically severe. The treatment of such MS is not mechanical or surgical. The treatment is the treatment of the underlying hemodynamic issues, tachycardia and high output state. And beside the low cutoff chosen by guidelines in MS gradient, a second difference between AS and MS gradient that makes MS gradient Poorly specific is that MS gradient is more labile with heart rate fluctuations than AS gradient. Tachycardia reduces diastolic time while increasing systolic time. Therefore, the diastolic flow per second across the mitral valve will increase because diastolic flow is equal to cardiac output divided by diastolic time. So when the diastolic time declines with tachycardia, the diastolic flow will inherently go up and therefore the gradient will go up. Mm -hmm. Systolic flow per second is much less affected because both cardiac output and systolic time increase in tachycardia. And that's a problem in this patient. So we discussed that the gradient is too lenient and non-specific. She has a gradient of 10. It could be just mild anatomic MS Okay, well, how can I prove mild anatomic MS? Echo is frequently not good enough to calculate the mitral valve area. Mitral valve gradient by echo tends to be highly accurate as it is easy to align Doppler with the mitral flow, but mitral valve area calculation by echo is frequently inaccurate. Well, how about cath? By cath, in order to measure a transmitral gradient, you truly need transeptal puncture, and simultaneous ALV measurement. Do not use simultaneous wedge LV measurement. Why? Wedge is a poor surrogate of LA in mitral stenosis assessment, even more so in severe pulmonary hypertension with extra damping of the wedge pressure as in our patient. So this is the LA pressure with a big V wave and A wave. Well, if you do wedge pressure, wedge pressure, is a damped form of LA pressure. You will have the same mean pressure as the LA, but imagine you take the edges of the LA pressure and pull them apart, elongate them. That's what the wedge pressure is. And it could be extra damped wedge pressure. So much so that compare the simultaneous LV LA measurement in this patient who has no MS, and you have endastolic equalization of pressure of LA and LV versus if you use wedge pressure, you will create a fake gradient because you attenuate that wide descent, you will create a fake gradient between the wedge and the LV and you create a fake impression of MS or an exaggerated impression of the severity of MS. So if you want to assess this patient invasively, don't do wedge LV simultaneous recording. You need to do LA LV simultaneous recording to get transmitral gradient. This is an illustration of such a case. Wedge LV in this patient, this is wedge pressure, this is LV. It gave you a wrong impression of MS. But if you get LA in red, there is no MS. Whenever you have end diastolic equalization of pressure, between LA and LV, there is no MS, or at least no hemodynamically severe MS. So what should we do in this patient? In this patient with a mean gradient of 10, hemoglobin 6.5 and sinus tachycardia, MS is unlikely to be hemodynamically severe. Next step in this patient, treat the anemia and the heart rate, then reassess the gradient by echo. That's the simplest next step. If invasive assessment is chosen, you need a transeptal LA pressure and LV, LA, LV simultaneous measurement and true mean gradient. Also seek when you do the invasive measurement, seek if there is endastolic equalization of pressure or not. The lack of LA, LV equalization of pressures in endiastole, meaning in endiastole, there is still a gap in pressure between LA and LV particularly with a big LA A wave and an absent or attenuated LV A wave is indicative of hemodynamically severe MS. This is also what we call the lack of end diastolic diastasis of the LA and LV pressures.
and most importantly, measure mitral valve area because we think even if he has a truly high mean gradient and lack of diastasis between LA and LV, this will be a hemodynamically severe MS driven by flow, not by a severely narrow valve area. Alternatively, we know that the mitral valve gradient by echo is highly accurate. All we need to do is measure the mitral valve area. So all we need from an invasive assessment is to measure the cardiac output. So you can use the invasive assessment to measure the cardiac output and plug the Hackey equation using the invasive cardiac output and the echo valve gradient, which is highly accurate. And then you can get an accurate valve area, more accurate than you can get by echo and more accurate than you would get by purely invasive assessment using wedge pressure mitral gradient. So this is what I call the hybrid approach. Use the gradient obtained from an echo done in proximity to your invasive assessment and use the cardiac output from the invasive assessment. You, you want your echo to be done simultaneously to your cath or close to it within a few hours of it. And this is what can be done in this patient and it will yield a valve area of 2.3 centimeters square using that Hackey equation and hybrid measurement. So we confirm the mitral stenosis is not anatomically severe. Now, this is another case, and that is the real case I had. This is a 75-year-old female with a history of recent mitral clip. She continues to have severe pulmonary hypertension. She is severely anemic. On echo, she has no MR, and there is a mitral stenosis with PISA seen on the LA side and mitral meaning gradient of 10. But the heart rate is 72. So unlike the prior patient, in this patient, the heart rate was 72. Is it severe MS? What's the next step? Like the prior case I just showed, I still here suspect that her MS is not severe. It is anatomically mild and it became hemodynamically severe with a high gradient because of high flow from anemia. But we're not tachycardic here. And therefore there is less hemodynamic stress on that valve to raise its gradient. So I'm not as certain in this case as in the prior case about the fact that MS is relatively mild anatomically. So what we did in this patient, I did the hybrid approach. I did the right heart cath and indeed the cardiac output wasn't high. And when I applied Hackey using that hybrid approach of invasive cardiac output divided by square root of the echo mean gradient, her valve area was 1.3 centimeters square. So this patient has an anatomically severe MS and she does not have a high flow condition nor tachycardia. So she would need strong consideration for mitral surgery. This is an LV aortic recording. What's the diagnosis here? I am not showing you diastole, so focus in systole. What's the diagnosis? So whenever you have LV, aortic recording, before jumping to severity of AS, always ask, what's the diagnosis? Is it AS? Is it dynamic LVOT obstruction? And it could be fixed LVOT obstruction. That's another diagnosis. Fixed LVOT obstruction will look like AS morphologically. The difference is that the obstruction is in the LV, and the only way to prove it is by catheter pullback using an end hole catheter. But the far more common diagnosis is AS or dynamic LVOT, dynamic muscular LVOT obstruction. What's the diagnosis here? It cannot be aortic stenosis because in aortic stenosis, the aorta and LV should not hug each other in early systole. It will, they will spread apart and you'll typically have an anacrotic point. Could it be hokum? It cannot be hokum. In hokum, you will have a in hokum with such an obstruction in such a gradient, you will have a spike and dome morphology of the aorta. Spike and dome in systole before the dicrotic notch. So this cannot be hokum. 
it's unlike to be fixed alveolar obstruction because fixed alveolar obstruction has similar features to aortic stenosis. You won't have LV and aorta hugging each others. It's like AS. There is a flow limiting point beyond which the aortic pressure will break down in subaortic fixed LVOT obstruction. It's measurement pitfall. That's the answer. The idea here is that your two transducers, the aortic and LV transducers, are not calibrated at the same level. They are not zeroed at the same level. The zero level of one is 30 centimeter higher than the zero level of the other. So you create an artifactual gradient. This patient has no LVOT or aortic obstruction at all. So if I am actually doing the study, I will re-zero both transducers at the same level. If I'm analyzing them from another institution, I will have a question mark. Now, this yes. is another case. This is LV aortic recording. What's the diagnosis here? This recording is another artifact. You have an excessively damped aortic waveform. We see no diacrotic notch, no anacrotic notch. This is how this patient would look like if the aortic waveform was properly damped. Imagine this is the same patient. This is his LV aortic gradient. It's in the moderate range. But then if you're damped with blood or air or very long tubing, you get this. And then you shrink that aortic waveform. You kind of, as if you grab the ends of it here and there, and you pull it out, you elongate it, and you get this. Now you'll exaggerate the gradient. And you'll exaggerate that pulses tardus and the parvus. You'll make it narrower and more delayed. So hence the importance of damping. And typically, you should verify those things when you're doing your recording. Zero both transducers at the same level and ensure proper damping of the waveforms. And this is what I call proper damping. Typically for the LV waveform, you need to see an early diastolic dip and ideally an A wave if you're in sinus rhythm. And for the aortic waveform, you need to see a dicrotic notch or sometimes not just an AI, an AS, your diacrotic notch gets attenuated, but you need to see maybe a hump, an anacrotic hump in the upstroke. So that's, you need to see those notching to call it properly damped. Also for the LV on our fluid filled catheter systems, you typically have some notching on the top, something like that, okay? Or something like this. So diastolic dip, a wave, some notching on top for the aortic waveform, dicrotic and or anacrotic notch. You want to see those to say they are properly damped. And I will explain to you, this is how we do our measurement, our LV aortic pressure recordings. There are two ways of doing it. And both ways are subject to artifact. And that's why I want, to I want you to understand well and understand how to counteract those artifacts. So one way is to put a long six French sheath from your axis, wh whether your grown axis or your radial axis. You put a long six French sheath, for example, from radial, we put a long 75 centimeter R2P hydrophilic sheath from radial to the aorta. Inside that, you put a four or five French catheter deep in the left ventricle. Usually it's a hundred centimeter catheter. So now you have a catheter in the LV and you have another catheter ending in the aorta. And the gap between the six French sheath and the four to five French catheter allows you to still measure pressure in that gap. Pressure from the aorta through that gap. Okay? Now, it is important to have your catheter, sorry, it is important to have that sheath in the aorta. You don't want it to be in the brachial, you don't want it to be in the iliac, simply because of what I explained, the systolic peripheral amplification. The brachial femoral pressures are higher than the aortic pressure. They are higher, therefore they may attenuate your gradient. 
Now, there is another way of measuring simultaneous gradients is by putting a short sheath, whether in radial or femoral, you put your short six French sheath or seven French, and through it, you put what we call the double lumen Langston catheter. It's a catheter that has two small catheters, actually two separate catheter in one. One catheter finishes in the aorta, while another catheter finishes in the LV. The problem, you're fitting two catheters in one. So basically, it's six or seven French. So you're having two 2.5 French catheter or three French catheter juxtaposed. So you're having really two tiny catheters. Why am I mentioning that? You do get a lot of damping with a Langston catheter. You may get LV damping, you may get aortic damping, just because you're getting pressure through a narrow straw. Imagine you're sucking through a narrow straw. You know, it's hard to get the pressure properly. You may get damping of that waveform, okay? You may get damping with this system as well from the catheters because, you know, you, if you're using a four French, the four French doesn't give you a great waveform. Or if you're using five French, the gap between six and five French is not that good. You may get damping of the aortic waveform. So damping is a big issue in our simultaneous measurements. Damping could occur at those setup system level in your catheter and sheath or in the Langston catheter for either LV and aorta, but damping can occur also, frequently does, across your tubing and your transducer. So the catheter and sheath are connected via tubing to an outside transducer. One of the tubing could be longer than the other, or it could be softer than the other, or it could have air bubbles or, or uh, contrast, and all this will damp the pressure transmission possibly of one more than the other. And this is unveiled by swapping transducer. You'll see me in the cath lab. I ensure my zero correctly. I ensure the waveforms look correct, properly damped. Then I swap the transducers. So this is the LV connected to transducer one. This is aorta connected to transducer two. I swap them and I get a change in gradient. Well, that tells me that transducer two or its tubing are damped. This is damped. So when I swap them, now LV is connected to transducers too. It becomes damp. And now you get dramatic variation in gradient. That will elucidate that you're having damping outside the body across that tubing or transducer. That does not highlight damping from the catheters and sheath themselves. If you swap transducer, there is no change, great. Maybe we don't have a damping error. Then you pull in the aorta, you get something like this. Good, you know, we have damping of that pink waveform, but it's not much more damp than the other. There is not a dramatic change in the measurement. But you pull in the aorta and you get this, while well, you say, ah, too bad. The gradient I measured was incorrect. This recording, the aortic recording, is way more damp than the LV recording. And therefore, my measurement is inaccurate because when you pull in the aorta, those should be superimposed. And since it didn't vary with swapping transducer, then the inaccuracy is caused by your setup, by your catheter and sheath. So in this case, what do you do? You change your way. Maybe in this case, if you're using six French Langston, you use seven French Langston. Maybe in this case, if you're using six French sheath with a four French catheter in the LV, change to a long seven French sheath with a five French catheter in the LV. So you make your catheters and tubes bigger. The ultimate solution is do double access, femoral and radial. A radial catheter in the LV, and femoral catheter in the aorta. And then you'll get the best simultaneous recording. So to summarize what I do, I always do the following. I usually prefer doing long sheath and a catheter inside it, smaller catheter inside the ventricle. And I verify four things in every simultaneous LV aortic recording. I verify the zero is at the same level. 
I open the transducer to air at the same level. That's one. Number two, I verify my waveforms look nice. They look properly damped, both the LV and aorta. Number three, after obtaining my initial recording, I swap the transducer and see if I obtain the same gradient. If not, that tells me I have an error in my system here, tubing and or transducer, and I need to flush more or shorten my tubing or change my transducers. And number four, if all that looked good, I do a pullback and I do that final verification. If I don't like my pullback, if it is like this, like I said, I'm okay. If it is like this, I have to redo, recross the aortic valve and redo my recordings. This is, for example, a case of a bad pullback. Those should be superimposed. One of the recording is way damped compared to the other one. You need to redo your recordings here. This slide summarizes the four pitfalls I talked about. Re-zero both transducer, ensure that both the LV and aortic tracings are properly damped, swap transducer tubing and do catheter pullbacks, verifying that the pressure superimpose in the aorta. I added the fifth one, make sure the LV catheter is in the LV body and not contaminated by the LVOT. And in patients with significant septal bulge, use an end hole catheter to, to avoid contamination by the AS subaortic flow acceleration. Now, this is another case. This is LV aortic pullback. What's the diagnosis here? This is LV, this is aorta, and here I'm, I'm showing you as different sweep speed. So the answer to this case is, on first look, it seems there is a gradient between the LV, about 130 millimeter of mercury, versus the aorta, about 95 millimeter of mercury. It seems there is significant gradient. Now, the morphology doesn't look like aortic stenosis. It's really sharp upslope of that aorta, no anacrotic notch doesn't look like hokum either there is no spike and dome there is a dicrotic notch here but there is no spike and dome before it but more importantly there is a big huge under dumping artifact frequently you get double horn of the lv uh, recording double horn on the plateau but they should be around equal or sometimes the first horn a little bigger when it's dramatically bigger like this or moderately bigger, more than 10 millimeter of mercury bigger, you're starting to think excessive under damping. And as I explained, you get more excessive under damping in the LV than in the aorta. So here you cannot tell it's a poor recording. If I have to guess, this patient is unlikely to have any obstruction, neither LVOT nor AS. I like to cut the horn when I see it. I cut it at least at this level. So I make it no more than 10, 15 millimeter of mercury higher than this second horn. So I cut it here. And if you cut it there, you end up with no gradient with the aorta. But the better answer is this is poor recording. You need to redo it. Uh, ensure proper damping, flush your system well. And sometimes it's really under damp because you have long, stiff tubing or because you have a hyperdynamic LV cavity that creates a lot of banging on that catheter, a lot of impact, and that creates excessive underdamping more in the LV than aorta. So uh, what you can do in this case, sometimes I aspirate a little blood on purpose in the catheter to damp it on purpose, to smoothen it. It's not ideal because then you can overdamp it rather than underdamp it. Anyway, here, the way I read it, I read it, there is an artifactual underdamping and the of the LV with an artifactual LV aortic pressure gradient. We do not believe there is any LVOT or aortic obstruction, and indeed on echo there was zero obstruction. This is a case where we pull back LV to the aorta using end hole catheter and side hole catheter in the same patient, and this illustrates to you one of the problem with side hole catheters. So what's the diagnosis in this patient? So we have a high gradient between LV and aorta. Is it severe AS or is it HOCOM? 
And those tracings are properly damped. They are nicely damped. You have early diastolic dip. Uh, you have a dichrotic notch. You may have a little bit of an anacrotic notch here. So those are properly damped waveforms. But where is the obstruction exactly? When you're pulling with a good hole catheter, you can localize exactly where your obstruction is. If it was at the LVOT, you will get a progressive drop in pressure in the LV. So it is AS. Morphologically, it fits with AS, that anacrotic notch, that sluggish upslope of the aorta. And the fact on pullback with an end hole, you localize the obstruction. The gradient is between LV and aorta. It's not within the LV. The problem when you use a side hole catheter in the same patient is side hole doesn't localize the obstruction. You have multiple holes. Some of the holes are capturing the LV. Some of the holes are capturing the aortic pressure. So you get an LV waveform that is hybrid with an aortic waveform. This waveform is from when the catheter is exactly here. Some holes in the LV, some holes are in the aorta. So you get an LV waveform, the systole of which is damped. So this is a case where side hole catheter made you think LVOT obstruction in patient whose obstruction is actually in the aorta. Okay. You can get the opposite. This is a patient who has subaortic obstruction. By the way, this is subaortic obstruction, not hokum. This is a fixed subaortic obstruction because of the morphology. You have a subaortic obstruction. It's a drop in pressure within the left ventricle, but the morphology of the aorta is anacrotic notch, not a spike and dome, no late dagger LV. This is actually more a subaortic AS, LVOT membrane. So this is mostly an LVOT obstruction. There is some aortic obstruction as well. There is a drop, but mostly subaortic obstruction. Now, if you use a side hole catheter, you may totally miss it. When you're in this area of the LVOT past the obstruction, you're contaminated by the aorta. So you get all of a sudden aortic waveform. So in this patient, you may think AS because you're using a multi-hole catheter. And you get contamination when you're in the LVT so much so that uh, you get aortic waveform in the LVOT. This is an illustration. So you have to keep the catheter deep in the LV and use end hole catheter in HOCOM. And whenever you're not sure where the obstruction is and you want to do a pullback, even if you're sure where the obstruction is, I like to use end hole in HOCOM and even in AS to keep my catheter away from the obstruction. Now here I show, if you do side hole and you pull back, as you're pulling, you don't see that the pressure drop in the LVOT because when you're here, you're contaminated by the aorta, you may just get aortic waveform. Even in AS, AS you get a flow acceleration and sometimes you get septal bulge and a little bit of LVOT narrowing in AS. It's part of the AS anatomy. But you always get flow acceleration in AS before the hole. You get a progressive pressure gradient or progressive rise in velocity all the way till you reach the aortic valve. This is kind of what you call the PISA of AS. So even in AS, if you put your catheter in the LVOT, you will underestimate the true severity. That's why I like to stay deep in the LV. One final idea here, how about cases of mixed septal bulge, septal hypertrophy with calcified AS? So you have mixed LVOT obstruction, mixed AS. We're seeing those cases in elderly patient. And then the question becomes, is this AS or HOCOM or both? Which one is the worst? Which one should I target? Should he get TAVR? So there are two possible diagnoses. You have severe AS, with secondary septal hypertrophy and LVOT flow acceleration, that AS PISA, which is part of the AS flow acceleration proximal to the obstruction and which is part of the AS anatomy. This is not a separate entity. This will get better if you fix the AS. So this is not AS with HOCOM. This is just AS with a flow acceleration. It could be a little more flow acceleration than the average person, but it's still part of the flow acceleration. 
Grossman textbook, as well as a paper published in the 80s in circulation research, suggests that in that LVOT area, you can get buildup of gradient of up to 30 millimeter of mercury in AS cases. And that's the most common scenario. But there is another scenario where the patient has hokum. He's also old and has calcific aortic valve and some AS. How to figure out the main problem? LVOT obstruction versus AS. So the answer is morphology. How is the LV morphology and the aortic morphology? You have a morphology late peaking LV dagger with aortic spike and dome. That's suggestive of hokum. Also the dynamic maneuvers, which may point to LVOT as a predominant obstruction. So on purpose, look at broken bro phenomena, induce a PVC, do a Valsalva. So those will help gear you. If you don't have the morphologic feature that happens with dynamic maneuvers and with PVC, you don't have the morphology of Hocum, it's more AS, then it's AS. Catheter pullback may help sort out if the resting ingredient is LVOT or aortic valve, you use an end hole deep in the LV and you pull back slowly. The only problem with catheter pullback is that sometimes the obstruction is very high in the LVOT and you really have a narrow zone between the LVOT and the aorta. So as you're pulling your catheter, depending on the pace, and depending on how hyperdynamic that ventricle, you may just skip that zone altogether. You may just go from the LV all the way to the aorta and miss that LVOT zone. That's the only problem with slow pullback. You may miss the zone. But another important idea by echo, I find echo to be very helpful. I will give you a great tip. So you have a patient by echo, he has high velocity across the LVOT slash aortic valve on continuous wave. You have velocity of five and you want to figure out, is it AS, is it HOCOM or is it mixed? Because this patient in this patient has calcific aortic valve. So when you have mixed disease by echo continuous wave, you will have mixed waveforms you will have a late peaking dagger shaped waveform which corresponds to the LVOT and you will have a rounded waveform which corresponds to the S and this is on continuous wave. You have round and late peaking and each one of them will depict the severity of each pathology. So his AS gradient velocity is only two. So his AS is not severe, it's mild. His LVOT, velocity is five. So this is severe dynamic LVOT obstruction with late dagger shape. It could be the other way around. You could have a round morphology going to four or five and inside it you see a shadow, a double shadow of a narrow late peaking morphology of two. Well in that case it's the aorta that is dominant, the AS that is dominant and severe AS with a velocity of four and the LVOT velocity is high because of either mixed AS hokum or more likely because of that AS subaortic flow acceleration that is part of the AS anatomy.